Londonderry, March 1970. Above the bog side, the Gloucesters patrol the city walls. Lieutenant Colonel Strether is their commanding officer. Strether is one of the most experienced Himalayan climbers in Great Britain. Thirteen years ago, he led an Oxford University expedition to climb a mountain called Haramosh. He barely escaped with his life. The three other climbers concerned are now all dead. The story of this expedition has been reconstructed in the Alps, using different climbers to enact the part of the people concerned. The party left their fourth and last camp and set off up the mountain. The altitude was 20,000 feet. Before them were the two great peaks of Haramosh, the mountain they'd set themselves to climb. It was August 1957. There was no chance of reaching the top. For weeks they'd been plagued by bad weather. Now it had cleared but there was little time to do more than make a reconnaissance. Tony Strether had been chosen to lead the group. A major in the British Army, he was the only one with Himalayan experience. Now, as he reached the ridge ahead, he got his first proper view of the main peak and the route which led to it. Between the secondary and the main summit lay a huge crevassed glacier The other members of the party were Oxford undergraduates. Ray Calbert, a Rhodes Scholar from New Zealand. Bernard Gillett, the expedition's organiser, and John Emery, a medical student. The four realise now that an attempt on the main peak would have been an impossibility for them. But Gillett and Emery decided to walk up a few hundred feet towards a great snow cap they'd nicknamed the Cardinal's Hat. Strether and Calbert sat watching them in the warm sun. Tomorrow they'd have to strike Camp 4 and start down the mountain. Strether felt reasonably satisfied. In spite of bad weather, a useful reconnaissance had been made. Strether was certain that Gillett and Emery were dead. Then, as he watched, two figures appeared, struggling out of the snow. Gillett was unhurt. He had a dazed recollection of huge forces which had torn him and tossed him around at will, of dropping endlessly into a great dark pit. Emery's hip had slipped out of joint. When Gillard tried to straighten his leg, he screamed in pain. Then, miraculously, as he turned his body, the joint slipped into place. The avalanche had carried them over a 400-foot ice cliff. They were perched on an exposed slope, surrounded by vertical ice. Below the snow basin, the cliffs dropped sheer for 6,000 feet. They'd lost their ice axes, torn from their hands by the force of the avalanche. Emery's gloves were gone too. Frostbite was inevitable. If there was an escape, upwards was the only way. They decided to start up at once. Almost at once, they came onto hard ice. Without axes to cut steps, it was an impossible task.
On the slope above, Strether threw down a rucksack packed with warm clothing. It rolled off course and bounded into a crevasse. Dusk was now approaching and Gillett and Emery decided to shelter for the night in the big crevasse at the bottom of the ice cliffs. There was little they could do until Strether and Culbert started their rescue attempt. Strether and Culbert decided to go back to Camp 4 for food and more clothing before starting down. Below in the crevasse, Emery and Gillett did their best to keep themselves warm. In such cold, the body needs food to maintain its heat and neither had eaten since before midday. They did manage to snatch some sleep, but both were troubled by nightmares verging on hallucination. Then, in the early morning, Emery thought he heard voices above him. Looking up, he saw a torch wavering in the darkness hundreds of feet above. Strether and Calbert had been climbing for most of the night, taking turns to hack their way downwards. It was desperately tiring work. The snow was packed almost as hard as ice, and cutting steps downhill is one of the most arduous tasks in climbing. Because of the darkness and the convex curve of the slope, they couldn't be sure of the route beneath them. They climbed in the track of the avalanche to avoid setting off another. As they went down, the slope became steeper and steeper. Then suddenly, Gillett and Emery were waving and pointing several hundred feet below. The route they'd taken led them directly to the verge of the sheer ice cliff. Now they'd have to traverse to the left to reach a point where the ice cliffs petered out and they could get down to the basin. Immediately they came onto hard ice, which forced them to cut up again to reach the snow above. The traverse lasted all day Calbert and Strether worked steadily, rhythmically. At those altitudes, it's fatal to hurry. Each person must make his own pace. If the pace is too fast, the body is overcome with breathlessness. Altitude sickness can bring headaches, dizziness and nausea. It can sap the will too, so that every effort, however small, requires a conscious command from the brain. As they neared the end of the traverse, Strether felt reasonably satisfied. The rescue attempt was going well. Then, Calbert lost a crampon. Both men realized the implications of the loss. The climb up would be arduous enough without handicaps of this kind. It was late in the evening when the two groups met. Gillett and Emery found it hard to express their gratitude. Words seemed inadequate. Strether decided to start the climb out at once. Dusk was falling and the night might just as well be spent climbing. They'd keep warmer that way. Calbert was leading, Strether behind him, then Gillett and Emery. Calbert's uncrampened foot had slipped and he'd cannoned heavily into Strether, dragging all four back into the basin. Up till that point, all had gone well. They were all tired, but buoyed up by meeting each other again. Now, after a heavy fall, 
exhaustion began to set in. Strether's axe had been torn from his grasp in the fall. There was nothing for it but to try again. This time, Strether led, climbing to a safe position, then helping each man in turn with the rope. It was painfully slow, but everybody seemed to be climbing well. At last, Strether was nearing the start of the Travis. Gillett had gone to sleep in his tracks. The fall concussed him. The others were badly shaken. Now, all were beyond climbing. Culbert's axe, the last in the party, had gone. They staggered into the crevasse to find what shelter and rest they could. Calbert's foot was giving him trouble. Now his crampon was gone, he could no longer wear his protective canvas overshoe, and frostbite was setting in. Strether took off Calbert's boot and cradled his foot in his stomach under his clothes. Emery's hands were frostbitten. Gillett was delirious. Every hour they spent in the open now lessened their chances of escape. As dawn came, they mustered their strength for yet another attempt. This time, Strether decided they'd climb without ropes. That, at least, would avoid the disasters of the night before. Strether thought, too, that each man should know his survival was now largely up to himself. Emery led. In spite of frostbite in his hands and feet, he seemed to be drawing on new reserves of strength. The climb up to the Travis seemed interminable. The steps were often full of driven snow and had to be cleared by hand. Below Strether came Culbert. Although hampered by the loss of his crampon and the frostbite in his foot, he was climbing well. Gillett brought up the rear. They'd now been in the open for nearly two days without food or proper sleep. Each man knew that this attempt would probably be his last. A few feet from the Travers, Emery saw an ice axe stuck in the snow. The ice axe was Strether's, wrenched from him in his fall the night before. Emery's newfound energy increased twofold at the discovery. Now they moved upwards with a new confidence and a new rhythm. At the start of the Travis, Strether took the lead from Emery, clearing the old steps with the axe. The party followed. Each man was now scarcely capable of coherent thought. It was futile to think about the length of the climb ahead. Each step safely taken was achievement enough. Each new step held the balance between life and death. They moved in a dream, aware only that they must keep moving, one hand, one foot, after another. No one talked. 
all their last physical and mental resources were concentrated on the task in hand. Below them, the ice cliffs dropped sheer for 300 feet to the basin. No one thought of the consequences of a fall. By late afternoon, they were nearing the end of the traverse. At this point, the steps ran downwards to the start of the last ascent. This was where Strether had climbed down too far in his descent with Calvert and had been forced to cut upwards to avoid the bare ice below. Now they were faced with an awkward downward climb. It was difficult because the steps had been cut the wrong way for descending, so that the boot had to be placed at an awkward angle. Emery and Strether had made it safely. In front of them was an easy climb to the ridge and to Camp 4 beyond. Camp 4 meant food and sleep and warmth. Safety was almost in their grasp. Calvert followed them. Almost immediately he was in trouble. Without his right crampon, he stuck on the descent. Emery saw him struggling and shouted up to Strether. Calvert had climbed magnificently all day, never complaining. But now the handicap was too great. Strether climbed back to help him with the rope. Calvert tied himself on and Strether climbed back up the slope for a belay. Calvert started down, but fell almost at once, taking Strether with him. Both men dropped into the basin. Emery and Gillard reached the top. They found the two rucksacks left there by Strether and Calvert two days before. They knew there were glucose tablets in one sack. Frostbitten and exhausted, they failed to find them. It was now nearly dark. Strether and Calvert had survived their fall. They'd lost their goggles and their ice axe. They were badly concussed, but they had survived. Half delirious, they crawled up the slope and collapsed into the crevasse for yet another night. Emery and Gillett set off for Camp 4 in the darkness. Before they made any rescue attempt, they needed food and sleep. Emery was now suffering from dysentery, and Gillett, in his eagerness for speed, soon outdistanced him. Emery staggered on after his receding figure. Soon, Gillett vanished in the darkness, leaving Emery to follow his track in the snow. Emery's fall knocked him unconscious. When he came round, it was day. In the darkness, he'd walked into a great crevasse. Gillett had probably done the same, but had climbed out again unscathed. Emery reached the lip of the crevasse and collapsed again. Later, it could have been minutes or it could have been hours, he opened his eyes. In front of him, Gillette's tracks stretched across the snow. Emery staggered on. His feet were so badly frostbitten that he could hardly walk. He was severely concussed. 
Only the thought of Camp 4 and Bernard Gillett kept him going. Gillett was fitter than he and would surely be able to do something. But as he walked, he noticed that Gillett's tracks were no longer leading in the direction of the camp. They crossed the old tracks made by the party three days before and went on. Hesitantly, Emery followed them. Gillett had walked off the mountain. The steps told their own story. Gillett had walked off the mountain in the darkness and had dropped to the valley 6,000 feet below. Bernard! 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 Emery staggered the last few yards to Camp 4. The consequences of Gillett's death were too appalling for him to grasp immediately. He was now beyond logical thought or further physical effort. When Strether woke that morning in the basin, he walked out of the crevasse and searched in vain for his ice axe. Strether was now suffering from concussion and snow blindness. Without goggles, the glare of the morning sun was unbearable. Culbert was almost spent. He too was concussed and he'd hurt his leg in the fall. Both men had spent the night in semi-delirium. At one point, Strether had thought he heard Gillard calling but distantly, as though from the end of a long tunnel. Painfully, Strether started to climb again. Each step had to be punched clear. Each move from hold to hold was an extreme effort of will. From time to time, he looked round at Calbert, who seemed to be progressing slowly, but well. Then, a few hundred feet from the Travis, he looked down again. Once again, Calbert's uncrampened foot had slipped. Again, he'd hurt his leg in the fall. Strether watched him as he made his way to the slope and started to climb. Strether had nearly reached the top of the first ascent when he turned and saw that Culbert had fallen once more. This time he was unable to walk. Culbert asked him what they should do now. Strether told him to stay there. He'd go on clearing steps. The others would soon be down. All that morning, Strether climbed. At first, he expected any moment to meet the others on their way down, Gillett and Emery, refreshed by food and a night in the warm. But soon, this thought receded in the mists of exhaustion. Soon, everything but the need to climb on was forgotten. Even the thought of Calbert, 
Calbert who had been so brave, so steady and uncomplaining, of Calbert sitting with his useless leg in the snow basin. Even this thought receded too. Useless to imagine what could be done when the top was reached. Get to the top first, if you could. To stop was fatal. The body was only too eager to give in, to rest and yield to the seductive drowsiness of exposure. By midday, he'd reached the end of the Travis, the place where he and Calbert had fallen the night before. As he started upwards, he saw above him his ice axe still sticking in the snow at the point where he'd taken his useless belay. The last climb seemed an eternity. Above him, the convex slope tempted him with an ever-retreating skyline. He fixed his gaze to the snow in front of him, not daring to look upwards. At times, he felt as though he were climbing out of a dark well. Sometimes, he imagined that some unseen force was drawing him upwards, guiding him to the top. At last he reached the rucksacks, lying as Emery and Gillett had left them. The glucose tablets were in the other sack. His useless fingers dropped them in the snow. Strether reached Camp 4 and found the half-conscious Emery in his tent. Emery told him what had happened. Strether went back to the mountain to call for Gillett. It was a chance in a million, but it was a chance that must be taken. Strether and Emery spent the night in Camp 4. Strether realised that his first responsibility was now towards Emery. Calbert had probably died the night before. Emery couldn't get off the mountain without his help. He could hardly walk as it was. His frostbite was so severe that his fingers and toes were later amputated. Strether took him down. It was better that two people should live than four people die. You may like to know that Lieutenant Colonel Tony Strether is now retired from the army and is working in a civilian appointment at Sandhurst. He's still very much involved in mountaineering and in 1976 led a successful expedition to Everest. This year he was elected president of the Alpine Club.